us as a pass through entity essentials for a successful partnership with your sub recipients. We are going to get started right away today. Um, we've got a great training filled with information and we want to make sure we have plenty of time to to get through it all. So again, welcome and we appreciate you coming and spending your morning with us. Um, just to let you know that this training will be recorded and it will be stopped during the, the Q&A, their questions and answer portion of uh, today's training. And then also, uh, just so you know, the questions asked today will be posted to our website after today's training, along with the recording slides and the resources shared. Uh, participation is encouraged. And by that, if you have a question, please feel free to use the chat box. We here at OFA, we're all monitoring the uh, questions in the chat box, or if you need assistance, we are there to help you. And then also closed captioning is available, so please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And before we kick off today's uh, wonderful training, I'm so pleased to um, be able to introduce myself. My name is Kristen Stout. I'm the director here at the Governor's Office of Federal Assistance. And if you're new to our trainings or new to OFA, um, I just wanted to give a brief um, explanation of uh, who we are. So we were uh, created uh, with the passage of Assembly Bill 445 of the 81st legislative session. So that was back in 2021. And with that, the Governor's Office of Federal Assistance, we are here to support our stakeholders in obtaining, increasing, and maximizing federal assistance. And our stakeholders are state agencies, local agencies, tribal governments, and nonprofits. And our mission M is to reduce the barriers by providing inclusive, collaborative, comprehensive, and central, centralized support in obtaining federal uh, dollars for Nevada, which is why we are so pleased to host our monthly virtual trainings. And um, we're going to go ahead. I would love to introduce you to our trainer today, Mayita Sanchez. She is our executive grants analyst and she has put together a fantastic training. Um, and, you know, be prepared. You're going to learn a lot. And um, I'm so excited to go ahead and kick it over to you, Mayita. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I cannot believe how quickly October has flown by. I'm kind of in shock a little bit. So hopefully you guys are holding on because it's the end of the year. Um, my name is Maita Sanchez. I am an executive grant analyst here with the office. I'm very happy to um, just bring some information to everyone um, in regards to sub awarding. Um, so today, um, just going to be really providing kind of like a 101, a really high level but not too high we're going to go ahead and dig into things um and then we're going to maybe not dig into so much into other things but at the end of the day um i'm really hoping that everyone walks away with an understanding of what a pass-through relationship should look like including how to determine the appropriate type of relationship you should be having with your partners and understanding the process what does that look like um you know, what does the sub award process look like and some resources to hopefully help you effectively sub award and be in compliance at the end of the day. Um, sometimes it could be a, managing multiple things at the same time and and sometimes it can be hard. You don't want to drop the ball somewhere. So I'm hoping this kind of provides you guidance with that. Um, we've taken the time to draft a sub grant manual. It is a guide to really ensure that any prime that acts as a PTE or a pass through entity is really aware and cognizant of what needs to be done, again, to ensure compliance and to really establish those positive relationships with your partners, with your subrecipients. So this training is really helpful, really, for any prime that acts as a pass-through entity. Um, sometimes you'll see that I do come from a state lens and do address some state specific policies and procedures um, for our state agencies that also receive federal dollars. Um, they're also considered a non-federal entity and then act as a pass-through entity. Um, so just keep in mind, I always tell everyone who will listen to me that it really is a micro of a macro, right? Um, you'll see that everything nests very, very well. So a lot of the practices that you see that you do that 
in a, a fed to prime relationship are very similar to practices that you see from a prime to pass through or subrecipient relationship. So um, just to give a little bit of framing and context. Again, as questions pop up, please drop them into the chat and they'll be monitored and we'll go ahead and be answering stuff towards the end. But as they come up during the presentation, please feel free to pop them in. So just a few definitions for everyone to get us again situated. A federal award is defined in CFR. It's assistance that a non-federal entity receives directly from a federal awarding agency. And then we have PTE here, pass-through entity. That definition is a non-federal entity, again, that provides a sub-award to a contractor or sub-recipient to carry out all or part of a federal program. Um, we do see here a visual to kind of help us see what that flow down of dollars looks like, right? It's a great reminder that as a prime, we are responsible for the flow down of all the rules and regulations from our awarding agency down to our pass through entities um, and then down into our sub recipients. Remember, always that as a PTE, you can always be a little bit more prescriptive, meaning you can narrow down further the rules and regulations that are being passed down into your subrecipient. As long as at a minimum, you always follow those federal and state rules that are required and applicable. Um, for example, any local governments or nonprofits that we have on the call today, if you have a board that requires any additional reporting or you require more time or you can always you know, take those rules um, and pass those down into your sub recipient. You just need to make sure that you're very clear and you communicate on whatever those expectations might be down into your um, through your notice of uh, or your sub award agreement. Sorry to your sub recipient. So some more definitions <laughs> so far. We've just talked about that sub recipient, but how do we know if it is a sub recipient relationship, right? So 2 CFR 200.331 really does provide us with guidance on how to make that determination. Um, if you do want to, um, I just wanted to make a note on terminology because I did use the word contractor earlier. Um, so as a separate a, a subrecipient may sometimes be referred to as a contractor or a vendor so you'll kind of see those three terms um used interchangeably sometimes um usually that partner that is a subrecipient is a contractor in a subrecipient relationship um due to the established relationship with a pass through entity through that sub award so i just want you to keep that in mind um sometimes when i do say contractor um, I might be talking about a vendor or a contractor that is in a subrecipient relationship. CFR Code of Federal Regulations. I just saw that pop up, so um, that helps us down the road. So a subrecipient is a non-federal entity that does receive a subaward from a pass-through entity to carry out part of a federal program. Keep this in mind. A subaward is the funding mechanism. It's an award uh, to a subrecipient for that subrecipient to carry out part of a programmatic portion of an award received by the awarding prime. Um, a contractor is a non-federal entity as well that receives funds for the purpose of you providing goods and services in a procurement relationship through the legal instrument of a contract, which is, an, um, again, the legal instrument by which a non-federal entity purchases property or services needed to carry out that project or program under a federal award. So keeping these definitions in mind, it is the responsibility of a prime to determine correctly the relationship between itself and its partners, their contractors, whatever that might look like. Um, this should be done immediately. So prior to writing or during the grant writing process, you want to identify and determine the types of relationships you will be having with those that will be helping you with your grant work um, as it will impact your budget. Um, it will impact your narrative um, and it will impact how those federal dollars are being spent. So you really want to explore and identify the substance of your relationships. Um, what's that going to look like? So as you can see here, I did a quick just a bit of a, a visual. You can see the difference between a subrecipient and a contractor subrecipient. They provide programmatic decision making and they have the responsibility to make some of those decisions. A contractor provides goods and um, services and it's part of their normal everyday to day business. Um, they don't divert too much from that. Subrecipients perform performance is measured against program objectives. So whatever's laid out in the uh, 
in the notice of award. A contractor, again, provides goods and services um, that are in addition to programmatic activities or complement programmatic activities. A subrecipient is responsible for federal compliance requirements. Again, talking about that pass down. Whatever's at that federal level that passes down to a prime needs to be passed down and communicated to our subrecipient. A contractor normally operates within a competitive environment, as we some of us may be familiar with that procurement process. Um, they act in that competitive environment and they are held to that um, work that is outlined in their contract. A subrecipient awarded via subaward. Contractor awarded via contract, or sometimes in the state we do do purchase orders. So we um, really need to clean up, um, or not clean up, I apologize. We have a cleaned up determination form um, that Shana put together for us. Thank you, Shana, which we'll probably be sharing afterwards um, to really help you score and understand that relationship that you have with your partner and to understand which funding mechanism may be best for your organization. Um, so um, I would highly recommend that you take a look at that form and you use that as that guidance um, so that you could see the different criteria and um, score and make that best determination possible. So remember to always use your best judgment when classifying each agreement um, and not to choose one over another because of the level of oversight you may have to conduct. So determination does affect the level of oversight. There is, um, for the most part, sub awards require a bit more monitoring. They require a bit more love um, in comparison to a contract, but this should not influence the type of funding mechanism that you decide to use to pass through your federal dollars to your partner. It should only be influenced by the type of relationship that you have with your partner, not by, oh no, now we're going to have to monitor at, at minimum annually um, type of um, monitoring. So just keep that in mind um, when you are making those determinations to make it based on the relationship and not the level of oversight that you may need to conduct. So just a couple of tips to spot or subrecipient. We get this question all the time. Is it a subrecipient or is it a contract? And sometimes you can see that um, some of those what looks like a contract, you know, a contract might be a sub award. It just because some of the work kind of crosses over and it can get a little bit confusing and you're not quite sure. So again, always use your best judgment. But always ask yourself, is performance being measured against program objectives? Like, do they have to meet these outcomes that we're having to meet as a prime? So a subrecipients really should contribute to that successful implementation and completion of that federal award uh, and program objectives. And they're responsible for the success of the federal grant. They're really giving you that lift and that help to make things happen with those federal dollars that are being passed down to them. Do they make programmatic decisions? So subrecipients usually do have that responsibility for program decision making, and that's related to their work. So they kind of have that general, hey, here's your scope of work. They have that ability to make that decision within their program, unlike a contractor who's like, hey, we just need to do this, 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 this based on that contract um, that you have with them and providing that service. Um, our regulations, um, what regulations are they required to comply with? So they usually have to comply with uniform guidance, as well as, again, any specific rules um, that you set forth in your award terms and conditions that are passed from that pass through from the prime down into our subrecipient. And our federal funds being used to carry out program work, you know, funds awarded to subrecipients are to be used for that, to complete objectives, again, of the grant and, and not only provide a good in the service, but again, add to the success of that federal grant program or project, whatever you might be working on. So just some tips as you're um, kind of exploring that relationship, again, trying to figure it out, writing it into your grant applications, um, it's important to keep that in mind. And if there's ever any questions as if, is this a contract? Is this a sub award? I'm not 100%. Um, even after you go through the, the weight of of scoring, um, you could always reach out to our team and, and we can brainstorm with you because sometimes it does come up and you think, but you just need a little bit of validation. So if it is a contract, if it is a contract, I don't touch it. We don't touch it. <laughs> so if it's a contract um, for our state agency specifically, um, please reach out to the Nevada State Purchasing Division. Um, they do have their processes um, to establish those contractual relationships. And um, for those in the state, you know, we do have the minimum. So if it's more than this or less than that, um, it has to be routed through different processes and reviews. Um, for those of my folks here that are not state agencies, 
there is a contracting toolbox that is very helpful for everybody if you haven't explored it on the their website, the Purchasing Division website. The toolbox um, provides classes, workshops, information on contract administration, some really good templates and forms that you could take a look at. There's also information for the statewide sets, the contract entry and tracking system, um, some information on training, how to really get into that and use that stuff. So um, please always feel free. I've had a really healthy relationship with purchasing. They're really, really helpful and willing to answer questions. So always feel free to reach out in regards to contracts if you do have any questions. So we're digging into potential sub awards or contracts, but before we even get too far into that, you're, you're doing this work. We're always planning for the future, right? We're always thinking about, okay, what next, what next? So monitoring is something that we should always really have in mind. Um, from the awarding agency to prime or from a prime that acts as a pass through um, to a sub recipient, we should always be on your mind that, hey, we're going to have to monitor. Um, and that prep work that we really do up front sets us up for success during and after our awards, um, after our awards are being managed. So you're kind of doing all this work ahead of time. You want to make sure that you're prepping um, for this monitoring that eventually is going to need to be done. So CFR does require that all non-federal entities that manage any type of federal dollars have internal controls and financial management practices um, in place that really promote the advancement of your organization, of an organization, and support your staff, our staff, in exercising good judgment and skill decision making so that we remain in compliance and prevent fraud and waste, right? We always are keeping that in mind. We want to remain in compliance. We want to make sure that we're spending federal dollars within the rules that are required, right? So a, a good set of internal controls is really going to ensure that we conduct you know, accurate risk assessments. Are we are we measuring risk well? Are we mitigating any um, problems that might come up? Um, are we mitigating audit findings? Right. And it at the end of the day, it really creates kind of a separation of duties um, to again mitigate any conflicts, uh, mitigate any audit findings. We're basically prepping to avoid any problems in the future. We don't want to have audit findings. So if you have a good set of internal controls. People are spooled up. People understand what the internal controls are and are seeing that in contr internal controls are being um, what would be the honored, right, and and respected and being used and and there's accountability for the practices that are being done within your organization. Um, you'll see that that organization is really success uh, set up for success to manage those federal dollars. Um, within their organization in a good way and again provide any audit. Uh, avoid any audit findings. If there's any questions about that, please always feel free to reach out. So in accordance with 2 CFR, again, all subgrantees and subrecipients have to have in place prior to the acceptance or receipt of any federal funds, again, that financial management system. At a minimum, this is going to provide accurate and cur current and complete disclosure of the financial status of each subgrant sub subrecipient. We want to know everything, right? Records are going to identify the source and application of funds for subgrants. They're going to provide effective control over and accountability for all funds, property, any assets that someone might have. Um, there's going to be a comparison of actual expenditures with reported costs and budget. So really a, an understanding of what's happening with the dollars that are being um, flow down into that subrecipient. There's going to be procedures to ensure that subgrants are expended and obligated within those effective dates of the subgrant period. So that period of performance, we want to be able to make sure that you know we're not going to have to deobligate, return any funds at the end because then those go back up to our prime, and then our prime has to go back up to the feds and be like, hey we didn't spend this. Why didn't we spend this? So we have to make sure that those internal controls and again, monitoring really are able to catch those things with enough time to pivot and make adjustments in our scopes or our budgets to really get all those funds expended, you know, in time, right? Um, accounting records um, are supposed to have some type of backup documentation, source and backup documentation. Those all need to be clearly outlined. And if we have our internal controls that really provide that method and system as like, hey, this is what this means, this is what that means. I mean, it really helps us um, ensure compliance, um, ensure prompt action, provide safeguards, and really provide reasonable assurance to the feds that, hey, we're going to be managing your federal awards and compliance with federal, state, and local regulations. So just keep that in mind. Um, as you are doing your sub awards, 
um, and, and finding partners and, and working through that process. Um, there's some great resources available. Again, um, it is a bit state specific, but also for our non-state agencies, I would highly recommend that you take a look at the Nevada Governor's Finance Office website, their GFO. They have some really cool resources. They have an internal controls training PowerPoint, which kind of walks through a lot of stuff more in detail. Um, they also have a accounting policy and procedures um, book, a Nevada State Accounting P Policy and Procedures Manual. Um, we are on slide 14. And they also provide internal controls monitoring self-assessment questionnaire. So um, this is something that you can look through. If you look through the questionnaire, um, you can kind of see where you guys are at. Um, really, at the end of the day, again, components of internal controls really allow for an organization to demonstrate integrity and a commitment to ethical values through the implementation of thorough and thoughtful internal controls. Um, we want clear responsibilities, clear definitions, separations of duties, authority is being appropriately dedicated to um, achieve goals. And that again, leadership and management are really modeling that behavior to develop and retain an environment, a controlled environment um, that you know, performance and accountability is being upheld. Um, so again, please visit the website. Um, a lot of great information that is available online to really set up not only your agency, but your subrecipients as well to make sure that they have those internal controls um, under control. <laughs> so next slide, subawarding. So what's next? OK, so we've identified our relationships. We know that, you know, folks have everything in order to receive federal funds. Um, subawarding. OK, so a notice of funding opportunity normally in the state refers to a published notice by a federal awarding agency. Um, just keep in mind that the state also uses this term when discussing funding opportunities published by a state agency or a non-federal entity that is also providing federal dollars to a subrecipient through that pass through relationship. Right, so the terms again may be used interchangeably. Um, sometimes in the state, I'll see that an RFP request um, or for funding proposal is also used uh, for a notice of funding opportunity when we're doing pass through funds. Um, so just keep that in mind. Sometimes it's the same, different thing. Um, but this guidance, I, I will go ahead and be using the term NOFO um, just to establish that prime to sub recipient relationship. So there are two options available. Um, for a non-federal entity acting as a, a pass-through entity when subawarding. The first, an agency may distribute funds through a non-competitive process, or the agency may distribute funds in a competitive manner. Um, for our non-competitive subawards, they're usually identified with the prime recipient's approved budget and scope of work. So it's written again, impacting your budget and your narrative. It's written into your grant application. Once that prime recipient does receive those federal, the federal notice of grant award, um, they can usually just go skip some of this next stuff that we're going through and draft that subaward agreement um, to get those funds out to their subrecipient. Don't forget. You still need to do a risk assessment, even if it's a non-competitive subaward, because that's going to impact your monitoring schedule. And for state agencies and partners, um, if they're going to be receiving funds from us, um, they do need to be a vend uh, registered vendor with the states. So that's done through the state controller's office. Now, if it's a competitive subaward, you set aside funds for a competitive subawarding. Um, like the state uh, RFP process that we some of us may be familiar with through state purchasing, it's very much like that. You're doing a notice of funding opportunity. Um, it's in, in, in it's kind of along those lines. You'll see the similarities. So funding announcements are drafted and published and then proposals are accepted, reviewed, scored and an award decision is made. So your competitive sub award announcements, it's basically a simplified version of the federal award awarding agency's guidance. Your announcement at a minimum should include these different things. The funding authority for the grant, a description of that grant program, goals and priorities, what are the eligibility requirements for the subrecipients applying? A statement on partner and collaborative requirements, if there's any, any grant outcome expectations, what your reporting requirements are going to look like. You want to set everything up ahead of time for them so they really know what they're walking into and if they're able to manage these funds, right? A statement um, on grant outcomes and expectations, uh, 
I'm sorry, detailed information of the templates and formatting requirements of the application as well. What does that look like? Your timeline for deadlines for each step in the sub award process, the award amount, how much is being intended to be used for this particular work. Um, you also want to set up your selection criteria ahead of time. This needs to be provided to them in this sub award announcement. What does that competitive selection look like? What criteria are they going to be? Um, a scored on and what is that weight of that different criteria. So general information on the review process and composition of the review committee should also be or could be provided information about special conditions if there are any or any requirements that are specific to the state or federal program and then expected date of award. So again, setting up those timelines. Hey, you know, when do we have to submit this by? What does this look like? Are you going to do a QA? and a Are you going to do any informative um, webinar? And then when can we expect that award once we do submit our um, proposal to that prime? So the notice of funding opportunity, we do ask at the state for to you for you to submit your NOFO to the governor's office of federal assistance. It's done online at OFA.mv.gov. We have a great notice of funding opportunity page um, where you can filter all um, pass through funds that are available to apply for. So please, um, once you have drafted that notice of funding opportunity, um, visit our page and upload or fill out that form so that information can be uploaded onto our website and made available to our stakeholders. Once submitted, the notice will be published again to the OFA website and available to the public. Um, you're also required to share your published NOFO. Um, the notice of funding opportunity should be shared to your agency specific website. If you have a listserv, email listserv, um, it could be shared via webinars. I just remember you do, it is competitive in spirit, right? The sub award process. So you want to make sure that you provide it to and through enough avenues to make it competitive. So individuals know that, hey, we're going to be applying for these funds. Um, these funds are available and they have the time um, to put those competitive proposals together and submit those to the prime. So remember always as well to review any federal program specific publication requirements. Um, always be familiar with your notice of grant award from the feds like, hey, these are the specific things that we may or may not have to do just in case there is something specific within that NOGA so that the prime is in compliance with how they should publish their notice of funding opportunity. So we've gone through this process. You've put together an awesome notice of funding opportunity. You've published it. Um, you're expecting to get proposals in um, to review to see you know, who to select as that subrecipient, as that contractor to subaward those dollars. Um, it's time to you know, do that review, decide an award. But before you do that, um, you have to go through the process again of putting together your review committee. You already have an idea because you've already fleshed out um, the competitive review, what they're going to be weighted on through your notice of funding opportunity and kind of who's going to make up that review committee. So the evaluators that you do select to do the review of these proposals that have now been submitted after you've gone through the process of your announcement, they have to disclose any conflict of interest, whether potential or perceived due to that individual reviewers, um, organization that they rep represent or the reviewer themselves. Um, sometimes if the if it's a non-competitive sub award and the person that is going to be allocating funds has some type of conflict of interest, that also needs to be disclosed. We have those forms available to, um, for individuals for both state and non-state um, to make those conflict of interest disclosures that again are potential right or perceived and that's important to keep in mind maybe there isn't a conflict of interest but it may be perceived that there could be a conflict of interest so it's always really important to document um, and and make those disclosures very very much in advance so the reasons that we do this is to really avoid and address anything that might again be potential actual or perceived we want to ensure successful federal audits of our state program so we want to make sure that we don't get any audit findings at the end of the day we want to maintain a status with federal agencies of low risk right we don't want to get an audit finding where a conflict of interest was not disclosed and now it moves us up a 
a tier in regard to risk. And now we're subject to much more intense and frequent monitoring, which really can take away from our day to day time that we have to actually manage our federal awards. So we always want to stay low risk, low risk, low risk. Um, it also helps us ensure compliance again with federal, state and local rules and regulations. So just keep in mind conflict of interest. You want to do this first. Make sure you get that out of the way and everything is disclosed up front. So you've pulled together your committee. You've received your proposals, um, competitive reviews. Now you want to do a review of those funds. So a competitive review really does allow for impartial allocation of funds. And again, part of the reason that we have the disclosure is we want to make sure that the process is transparent. It's documented, documented, it's impartial, um, and that you have a plan to really um, how you're going to be awarding those dollars. So have a standardized procedure to review your proposals for completeness, timeliness and submission, um, budget adequacy, do they have enough budget, um, merit, technicality, impact of the project, demonstration of need, post risk. You want to take all of this into consideration as you're re um, reviewing those proposals that have been submitted. You want to make sure that um, their organization um, vision and mission aligns to the work that's being done at the federal level and aligns to the prime and making sure that it complements again and that those programs um, objectives and uh, deliverables are being met and will be able to be met. Um, so just keep that in mind when you do those reviews. Transparency, make sure you document everything. Um, make sure you save everything. Don't throw anything away. Um, and um, also have an appeal process in place for individuals if they're not um, happy with the, the results of those reviews. Um, you want to make sure that you do have an appeal process for your subrecipient. And again, we have forms and templates to support all of this, so you don't have to build anything from scratch. So just keep that in mind. Um, so you've gone through this process. You've now um, gone through the competitive review process. You've hopefully selected a vendor or a contractor as your sub recipient. Um, and now it's time to make that sub award. But before you make that sub award, you cannot make that sub award until you do your risk assessment. And this is a must. And I know sometimes we're kind of like, ah. <laughs> but the, this is a critical step in that award determination because, again, all of this information is feeding into the final sub award agreement that we'll get to, I promise. Um, and it and it does inform monitoring expectations that need to be documented again in your notice of award. So do that risk assessment. We have a great risk assessment um, that Sheena has put together for us that you can use um, to help you score just a rubric. So scores will be given for normally for federal and technical review, right? You need to check, do they have a UEA number? Are they on the suspension of debarment list? If it's a contract, do they have any derogatory remarks? Um, you want to look at performance history. What have, what, how have they performed in the past? Were there any problems in the past? Quality of management, financial stability, and program specific risks. How long have they been around? Have they done this before? Is this a really, really, really big award and they've never had a really big award before? Before because that might impact their their tier or their risk. So here we do see these tiers, and I and I broke them down. We broke them down into three tiers: tier one, two, three. You have your low risk, which is where we want to live. We have moderate risk, where folks can have a little bit of low or high risk tendencies, um, but they're not one or the other. And then we have individuals who are considered high risk. So I hear again, it impacts your monitoring. So there's increased monitoring, the higher risk of that subrecipient might have. So some attributes of a low risk, a subrecipient, excuse me, can include that they do have high quality programmatic performance. They haven't really had any significant audit findings or monitoring findings in the past. Um, they're usually, they're always, more than likely com in compliance the terms and conditions of their prior awards. Again, there hasn't been any um, negative things that have popped up in the past. They don't have, um, they've always submitted timely and accurate financial and performance reports. It's never been difficult for them or difficult for you as a prime to get those reports from them. They uh, are known to have, um, they are known to not have any financial management problems. They seem to be stable financially, um, et cetera, et cetera. Those in high risk 
pretty much the opposite. <laughs> um, they've had a history of unsatisfactory performance in the past. Um, they've it's been difficult for them to adhere to proper grant terms and conditions. They've had issues in following through with compliance. Um, there is documented financial management problems or instability within the organization. There have been significant findings or questions about costs um, from prior audits within that organization. There's a lock, lack of contact as well. Maybe there's a lack of communication like, hey, we can't even get a hold of these folks. That would be considered high risk. There's no prior monitoring being done. It's kind of like a credit score. They don't have any credit. No prior monitoring or auditing done that moves them up a little bit into the high risk category. Um, again, um, award amount. If it's really, really large, maybe it's the first time or the program has highly complex requirements. They have to, there's a lot of moving parts in the sub award agreement. Um, so that would also put them at a bit higher risk. So it would mean that they would just need increased monitoring, right? And then we have the folks in the middle, like sandwich in between, like maybe there's a little bit of components. Maybe it's a really, really large award amount and they've never had an award this large, but historically, They've always been in compliance. They've never really had any um, issues, compliance issues. They follow through. So maybe that puts them, you know, in between a moderate, like a moderate risk, because this is the first time they're going to be managing this type of award. Um, but historically, with lower amounts, they haven't had an issue. So we're going to go ahead and assume that, you know, they're they're going to be able to manage that. So just um, keep that in mind um, when you're doing your risk assessment. Again, it's going to affect your monitoring schedule. Some best, best practices always as you're doing your risk assessments is to really identify those areas of improvement, create work plans with your subrecipients if anything does come up to resolve any concerns. Um, you want to monitor all your reports, all your reimbursements, all of your milestones, your backup documentation um, to make sure that there isn't a change of risk level, right? So maybe there's an improvement. Maybe they're considered a high risk or moderate risk, but now that we've seen a change, maybe we, we can move them down into a low risk, or maybe it's the opposite. <laughs> they were low risk, something happened, kaboom, and now we have to move them up a tier into high risk. So just keep that in mind. Again, we have some really great resources to help you um, go ahead and do those risk assessments, um, some tools um, that we can provide to you to support that process. So um, you've done your risk assessment. It's fantastic. We have a low risk um, subrecipient, let's just say, right? Um, for the most part, right? Um, if you're a state agency um, and we need to get those funds out to our subrecipients, every uh, vendor needs to be registered with the state controller's office. And I did mention that a bit earlier. Um, it, it's necessary to perform any um, fiscal transactions and again, to track all of that information we also can't pay them. We we can't pay them if they're not registered. So payments are not electronic. Vendor registration can be done here. That's a live link. So go ahead and um, go through that, but just keep that in mind for our subrecipients. So issuing a sub-award agreement. Yay! <laughs> As a reminder for our state um, pass-through entities, all subrecipients, again, must register with the controller's office. Um, because there is no direct agreement between a subrecipient and the federal government, a pass-through entity is really responsible in ensuring that their subrecipients stay in compliance, right, with applicable federal regulations and requirements, and that these are clearly stated and incorporated in your subaward agreement. So subawards have to be clearly um, communicated, identified, both for competitive and non-competitive awards to any of our subrecipients. We do have a subaward agreement template to assist you. It's pretty basic. Remember, there is no direct, uh, again, agreement. We have to communicate this information, all applicable federal regulations and requirements. They have to be incorporated within your subaward. Your monitoring, um, reporting expectations need to be all communicated and incorporated into that subaward agreement. Um, if any information is not available, for whatever reason you don't have that, the PTE is responsible for providing the best information that it has within that sub award. So this is really setting up your relationship with your PTE. You want to communicate, you want to review, you want to document, you want to make sure that all of that information is readily available to them. So there are requirements for the sub award agreement, uh, CFR, Code of Federal Regulations. <laughs> um, the sub award agreement, um, again, there are requirements what needs to be provided and incorporated into that sub award agreement. It's two slides worthy. 
um, and I will not read through everything, but I did want to make this available to the folks who will have the PowerPoint available to them afterwards. Um, it's really, really important um, that you do incorporate all of this into your subaward agreement. The federal award identification, their subrecipient name, that name needs to match their UEI number. Um, the federal award identification number, where is the money coming from? Um, the date of award to the recipient, um, period of performance, their budget period, start and end date, the amount of federal funds that are going to be obligated from the PTE to that subrecipient, um, the total amount of funds obligated to the sub by the PTE, including any current obligation that they may have, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then there's a whole nother little slide over here with additional information. I do want to take um, a little bit of time to identify the identification of whether the award is research and development. So, a research and development is identified or defined in a uniform guidance, and it means research activities, both basic and applied, and all development activities that are performed by a non-federal entity. Um, so just keep that in mind. This needs to be um, called out in that notice of award because it does impact how that spending is done. Um, so make sure that those different things are, or if it's not. Um, and again, will you want to incorporate into your sub-award agreement um, any indirect that may be um, charged or may be required, um, again, reporting um, appropriate terms and conditions that are specific to that subaward. So once accepted, the non-federal entity or subrecipient must have that administrative financial and progr programmatic capacity to really carry out the activities that are set forth in your subaward agreement. They are responsible for meeting all post-award and out, out uh, requirements as set forth again. Um, so just note, a subrecipient contractor may not expend award funds prior to having a completed subaward agreement that is signed and fully executed. So um, don't start any work, much like a contract, don't start any work until you have that subaward agreement fully executed, meaning that everyone has signed it. Um, you're a registered vendor, if that's a requirement for payment, and um, you're ready to roll. So reporting responsibilities. So to comply again with CFR, we're always trying to comply. Um, it's important, there's, there's certain reporting responsibilities um, that we do have. So we do have expectations from prime reports to the federal, right? Subrecipient reports to the prime, the PTE. Um, again, the reporting requirements and responsibilities need to be communicated, those expectations within that subaward agreement. Make sure you read your agreement and you really understand what um, your responsibilities are. Um, reporting can be done quarterly. It can be done monthly. Again, it's going to be set forth in your agreement, but it cannot be done no less than annually um, per CFR. Um, you'll find that reporting is usually financial and pro programmatic or like a performance report. Um, and we do have um, um, guidance on that in our manual as well, if you have any questions. There is also the requirement for the single audit. So this needs to be included as a pre-award certification form in that notice of funding opportunity and reviewed um, when submitted by a separate subrecipient for that single audit report requirements. Um, and you could dig into that. Um, it, we, we could you, single audit. Um, it depends. It's a, usually a cap if it's more than 750, like aggregate, they would have to do a single audit. And just remember that a prime is also required to file a FAFATA, and I'll go into that. Um, subaward report by the end of the month, following the month in which a PTE awards a subgrant greater than or equal to 30,000. So digging into FAFATA, the Federal Spending Funding and Accountability and Transparency Act, or FAFATA, um, requires that information on federal awards be made available to the public via a single and searchable website that's centralized. That website is usaspending.gov. If you have not explored that website, highly recommend snooping through that. This allows prime recipients of federal funding and prime contract recipients to report sub-award activities, um, as well as any executive compensations that need to be reported. Any state agency that does receive funds as a prime recipient and sub-awards funds to a contractor the cap is 30,000, needs to um, log into FAFATA and um, make that reporting required reporting 
So you complete reports here for these different things, and I went ahead and listed those for you. You do need your UEI number to register, um, and you do need to register for the federal sub-award reporting system, which is online. You could do that through the link down at the bottom. So all state agencies should have documented procedures and internal controls to ensure that your staff is reporting this information in a timely and correct manner, um, because it, the intent is to have um, this information transparent um, and available to the public. And here we kind of see that visual, you know, we have our subrecipients. So we're, we're reporting from the, again, from the Fed to the prime to the um, sub. So yes, yeah, so if there's any questions about that, please feel free to reach out. We also have some information available on our policies and procedures um, to support that. And I apologize if I'm moving too fast, but I'm looking at time and I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> So I did want to touch on methods of payment um, here. So an agency, again, we have to specify the method and schedule of payments to a subrecipient um, within our subaward agreement. And again, that requires that fully executed subaward signatures and all. Um, there are two different types of reimbursement. Um, re payment methods. We have the reimbursement method and then we have advanced payments. So the reimbursement payment um, is usually what is preferred. That's what we normally see. It's preferred. The subrecipient has to submit a request for reimbursement, something that we call an RFR in state, um, and it has to correspond to a line item in the approved subaward budget. So you, you're get this request for reimbursement, you're going to have to walk it back and make sure that all of those costs are allowable, allocable, and reasonable and aligned to the work that was agreed upon. Um, again, um, it's some awards with any past due performance reports, just as a reminder, they have to have a written extension from a pass-through entity before any, receive, any payment can be received. Um, and again, your subrecipient has to be registered with uh, the state controller's office if it is a state type of relationship to receive payment. Um, always double check your internal controls, policies, and procedures to ensure that processing of payments are being done in a timely um, manner, that they're being done correctly, and that it's consistent, right? You always want to check to ensure that current versions of all of the forms that you're using are current um, for fiscal transactions that are happening. We also have the option of advanced payments. So this is not usually looked upon kindly, but it is an option. Um, you can pay a subrecipient for costs associated with a grant prior to a cost being incurred. You have to take into consideration past performance, right? Are they high risk? Are they low risk? Um, and you need to do an evaluation of their financial statements, again, to really understand the risk. If we do this advanced payment, are they going to adhere and honor the civil award agreement? Um, because at the end of the day, the prime that pass through is responsible for reporting up that next level. So we want to make sure that we're not um, setting ourselves up for failure. Backup documentation it has to be within that sub award period, even if you do that advanced period payment of performance and include a written justification. And that written justification needs to be reviewed and it needs to be approved. Everything needs to be signed off on prior to any advanced payments being made and everything just needs to be doc, uh, documented. So source and backup documentation, it really does do um, us a favor to really understand what that backup documentation should look like. Everything should be legible. Everything should be dated within that period of performance that set forth in that sub award agreement. It really helps us um, support a no finding status for our audits. Again, coming back to that audit, we don't want an audit and it helps substantiate and understand an expense. Why is this expense being made? You know, what is that backup documentation? Am I okay and authorized to pay this and to um, make that expenditure? So examples of backup documentation can include, but are not limited to personnel records, um, timesheets, um, time and effort reports if that is how that is being done any invoices any receipts any purchase orders again dated signed legible within period of performance um, and make sure you take the time to review those I, I know sometimes it can be a bit tedious especially when you're going through timesheets and you have to make sure okay are they really allocating their time to what it is that we agreed upon am i okay to pay this because at the end of the day Again, we are responsible to make sure that those funds are being spent within compliance. So coming back to um, kind of that idea of, okay, we have to monitor, 
we have to make sure that we've set everyone up for success. Now we're going to go back in. We have this accountability piece, monitoring. We have to make sure that processes are being followed and that we're evaluating those processes to make sure that subrecipients are really administering their grants in accordance to the requirements, right, that are found within that um, agreement. So um, to CFR 200, 328, oh, there's a typo, <laughs> details those responsibilities for subrecipient monitoring. Um, the non-federal entity or the PTE is really responsible for overseeing the operations and activities supported by a federal award. The non-federal entity must monitor its activities under federal awards to assure compliance, again, with applicable federal requirements and to ensure performance expectations are being achieved. Um, our program needs being met, our funds being expended. Monitoring must cover each program, function, or activity, and um, at a minimum, it must be conducted at least once a year. Again, your risk assessment is going to determine that monitoring schedule, so there might be more frequent monitoring that needs to be done. So just keep that in mind. So process and intent. So PTE should identify potential audit issues, right? And provide that technical assistance and training and implement corrective actions when necessary. So the focus when you're doing monitoring is really on that day-to-day -day management of a grant award to ensure that it is being administered properly and we are in compliance. So normally you would wanna notify that you're going to be doing a um, review, right? And that you're going to be requesting documentation. Um, then you're going to review and then you're going to provide back feedback results and then establish any corrective action and follow up if necessary. Um, you could always consider can do, um, doing periodic desk reviews. Desk reviews are sometimes less timely. Um, they can be done remotely, which is nice. Um, you want to request your documentation. You want to set up timelines um, uh, for submittal by either email or maybe you set up a shared drive. If you have reason to believe that a subrecipient is not maybe complying with an award agreement or if they're a high risk, you could always schedule a live desk, go in person type of review um, so that they can show you the requested documentation and information um, and show like where are those stored, what does that look like and really provide that information to you. Um, for both programmatic and financial monitoring, you might wanna consider doing on-site visits. It, it can be a little bit more time consuming, but they are effective really in ensuring um, that all documentation and information is really being kept up to date, right? This is especially true if you do like a little pop and you do a surprise on-site visit, although um, you probably just want to reserve that for high risk um, folks um, or if you suspect that maybe something is happening. Um, so when an on-site visit is conducted, just be really considerate of your subrecipients' time, their resources. They're really allocating time to us to help us you know, move our federal programs forward. So be thorough, but don't really overextend your assessment um, and make sure that, you know, we're communicating and that um, everything's being done in an adequate and timely manner. Expectations are being communicated clearly um, so that we do set up that healthy relationship with our subrecipient and we're able to work together. So corrective action and troubleshooting. So always follow up and ensure that findings, again, are clearly communicated, that corrective action if needed is being taken and documented, um, that training and technical assistance is provided um, and available. You could set up a plan and be like, hey, this is what we're going to do within this time period. Consider their current monitoring schedule and whether they may need to be revised. So if Again, there's a change. Maybe we need to do more frequent monitoring or maybe we've um, corrected some things and we can maybe revise that schedule and do less monitoring. Um, but again, always clearly communicating to our subrecipient. Um, if a subrecipient is performing unsatisfactorily or is non-compliant for whatever reason, you could always consider withholding disbursements until they fix it. Um, you could always not issue any further awards. You could always disallow costs and you could always suspend or terminate that award depending on what is happening. So always document, make sure the authorized folks are taking a look at this, approving it before you move forward and that um, you've pretty much exhausted all technical assistance. You know, hey, we need to get you up to par. This isn't happening. You know, this is the step that we're going to take. So last, we have closeout. Um, so closeout process, sub awards do need to be closed out. Um, uh, primes need to do closeout as well. So really know your sub your responsibilities as a prime and as a sub recipient. Make sure you read your sub award agreement. Um, 
our subrecipients will need to close out to give primes enough time to also work through their closeout processes. So again, the micro of a macro reasons for closeout can include, hey, it ended, no more project. Um, maybe the project was completed by the subrecipient already. Maybe there was a non-compliance issue. Um, or maybe there's just a mutual agreement that, hey, it's time to close out, we're moving forward. Again, always reference to CFR um, and take a look at your timelines. Usually it's 120 days or 90 days for subrecipients to request that information and get that information up. So then it allows the prime enough time to then trickle back up and do that close out as well. So always be organized. Make sure you document and track. You read and understand your sub award and always reach out to your prime, your pass through entity if there are any questions in regard to close out. Um, so we do have a handy dandy little closeout checklist just to kind of know deadlines um, and kind of take a look at that and help you guide you in your closeout process. So that brings me to an end. We do have the Nevada Grant Policy and Procedure Manual. It's currently being updated. Um, policies are being revised and reviewed. So these are kind of the policies to reference that I touched upon today in today's training. We do also have forms and templates to reference, which will be we will be sharing out post training as well. Um, the ones that we do have posted online right now are a bit dated, so we are going through the process of updating those to provide you with current ones. We also have the Nevada Grant Manual, which was recently updated. And it really does provide that guidance to everyone on all of these processes. Um, you'll probably find a lot of information that I yapped at you <laughs> is written within the grant manual. So always take a look at that for further guidance. Um, we also have additional grant resources, including these trainings. If you need any help with technical assistance, um, always feel free to reach out to us with any questions. So that brings me to the end. And we'll pop in links and then um i do ask that you provide us your feedback thank you everyone for spending time with me i have four minutes left so go me um there's a survey here for our post event if you wouldn't mind taking the time to go um, fill that out i would really appreciate it but i will go ahead and pop over to akia and i yes, guess perfect. we'll go through a couple of questions and then if awesome. i don't know anything we can meet offline 